Hello, my friends. Uh, thank you for joining us today and welcome to Chamber Chat. I look forward to spending a few minutes with you today. And as you know, in this series, we try to talk to business leaders and significant individuals in our community who help stimulate business and help us grow to the next level. Today, I'm going to introduce you to Mary McPhee. Mary, hello. Welcome. Good Hi. to have you here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, Mary is kind of our, our resident expert in all things artificial intelligence. And uh, I'm Ray Lagan with the Granby Simsbury Chamber of Commerce. I'm the executive director. And what we're trying to do in these series is to bring together individuals who can bring some more content to us to help us grow our businesses. And Mary, with her expertise in this field, spends time understanding the technology. And today we hope that she will help demystify that for us. She'll help us understand a little bit more about the micro view of it and the macro view of it and how as businesses we can use it to grow our revenue base, to maybe simplify our lives a little bit, to uh, hopefully add some more structure to the things that we do on a regular basis in a more organized fashion. So all things artificial intelligence are what we're gonna learn from Mary in just a few minutes. Uh, but I thank you again for joining us and we look forward to hopefully answering some of your questions later on. We'll have a few slides to show you some more of the content behind this as well. But let me begin by just talking to Mary, welcoming you again and asking you a little bit about how you got started in this whole field, Mary. So, yeah, absolutely. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and being here. Um, so how I got started in artificial intelligence is, is really, I would say, Artificial intelligence is a vast landscape. Um, it's really broad and at its base level and core, it's computer systems or algorithms imitating human intelligence. So I know there's a lot of buzz about AI today, but the reality is it's really been around for 70 to 75 years. Mm -hmm. And often a lot of times people will reference Alan Turing as using artificial intelligence to solve Enigma back at, in World War II. So, at its base, you know, it's really the infusion of technology and the evolution of technology and how we're using that to do more powerful things as, you know, as the years progress. So what's most interesting and, and probably where it's evolved to today and what all the buzz is about is, is generative artificial intelligence. And so that's really evolved in the last two to five years. So my entire career has been very tech forward, tech involved, and along the way with you know machine learning and deep learning which are variations of artificial intelligence so as it became more capable and more complex um, that's kind of led us to where we are today with the latest buzz of generative artificial intelligence which at its again at its core just to keep it simple the difference today versus the last you know 60 70 years is that now we have systems that are actually generating new content. Okay. So from my career standpoint and how I got into the field, I've really intersected technology my entire career to date. And my attraction to it is really just understanding that technology is so interwoven in everything that we do. It's very forward, it's not going anywhere, and it's really future-proofing you know, my career and my understanding of... Well, um, you said it's not going anywhere or it is? Well, I mean... Technology's it's, not going away. It's not going true. away. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to learn to deal with this. Oh, right? we are going to have to learn to deal with this okay. and to be, you know, perpetually relevant, understanding it, um, you know, is the best approach, at least from my perspective. Well, and that's a good thing. I mean, it's here to stay, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's obviously that it's being utilized now, but what I'm hearing and what you're saying, it's been utilized in some capacity for decades. We just weren't aware of it or hadn't labeled it, maybe. Is that the case? Yes, absolutely. And I think when you, I mean, even as a consumer, we interact with it every single day. If you think about your how you interface with Netflix and how it recommends shows that you might like, or if you're on Pandora and you give a song a thumbs up or a thumbs down and then it recommends more songs and you start to find yourself like, oh, I really like this playlist. All of that is artificial intelligence. It's taking inputs, it's making predictions um, as outputs. So we interface with it as consumers. You know, Even though we don't necessarily know it. You don't necessarily no. know it. <laughs> are, are all the big guys using it now? I mean, is it is it? everywhere and we just don't know it? Is that the case? Yeah, so I think the short answer is yes, especially on the spectrum that we talk about as far as artificial intelligence goes. When you narrow it down to the recent two to five year boom yeah. of generative AI, where it's actually creating new output, so new written words, new uh, images, new video, new audio, uh, that is basically what the 
the hoopla is, the buzz in, in, the, in the recent years. And I would say, yes, all of the big players are also starting to integrate that into their products as well. So when you just, for example, think of like Microsoft, Okay. And they are they have a product they've rolled out. It's called Copilot, and it's integrated within PowerPoint, within Word, within Excel, and similarly with Google. They're doing it with their sheets and their slides and everything like that. So, you know, whether or not people can look at artificial intelligence and say this isn't going to impact my profession, I would argue that alone. Okay. <laughs> but I would also say if you think it won't impact your profession, it's absolutely going to impact your personal life. You'll you'll come across it in some regard. So it's real easy to go into the deep end pretty quickly with this, it seems like. I mean, the, the technology is changing rapidly, and uh, but what's already in place and already being used is already over the heads of most of us. Should we be fearful of this, or what, what kind of approach would you take towards this kind of technology? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think it's easy to be afraid of stuff you don't understand. Um, and I think that, especially with the generative AI and the capabilities that are emerging now, it's, it is easy to be fearful of it. So what I always suggest to people is to educate yourself. And that's really my approach as well. I am, you know, up to my eyeballs every week in podcasts and articles and listening to thought leaders and really educating myself on the capabilities, the possibilities, the risks, everything involved. Because as we talked about before, it's certainly not going away. Right. Um, regulation is, is questionable and what that looks like, no one really knows. Um, so educating yourself, I guess, positions you uh, to understand the fears appropriately. So I wouldn't say don't fear it. Okay. And I also wouldn't say like go running for the hills. Well, what I'm hearing and what you're saying, Mary, is a healthy respect. Healthy respect. But um, you're passionate about it because obviously this is full time for you now. So what's the most exciting thing that you see that, you know, the technology would allow us to do that we couldn't do before a couple decades ago? Yeah. Um, I am very passionate about it. <laughs> <laughs> and the capabilities are endless, I would say. And it's really like when you think of the possibilities and how vast they are, mm. I think it's really the limit of our own creativity and our own thought process behind it of what we can use it for and what it can do to support us. So at this point in time, you're seeing a ton of new startups, a lot of new product development. This, these emerging capabilities have really ignited ideas throughout business in general. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really fascinating to see the different use cases and it's definitely a turning point in history um, and it's going to really revolutionize how we do everything. Well, let, for our viewers' sake, when you and I first started talking sure. about this kind of interview, we said, let's use the technology to prove the technology. Yeah. Let's give it an opportunity. And I'm going to ask you to kind of walk us through what you did. What, just so you all understand, what we tried to do was to look at this technology to ask artificial intelligence what we should talk about on this show. Let it teach us how to best use it. So it's kind of using it to prove itself. So can you walk us through what you did to actually come up with some of the questions that we're talking about today? Yeah, definitely. So the most prominent that I'm sure everyone has heard of is ChatGPT. Um, there are, they're by OpenAI, and it's basically a generative AI chat bot at its simplest terms. Um, there's definitely a lot of other competitors out there that offer comparable products. But what I did was use ChatGPT and went in, and it's really important to give it context. So instead of just saying, you know, write me some interview questions about where we stand with generative AI and the future of AI, you can certainly do that and you will get an output 100%. You'll always get something back and immediately too. It's quite impressive. But what you can do is if the more input you give it, the more context you give it, the more background you give it, the better the output is going to be for you. So I actually went in and described a little bit about you know, the context, like what are we doing? Who am I actually speaking with during this interview? What do we want to provide, you know, the people that are listening to the video and just gave it additional context about, you know, what we we're trying to achieve and the value that people could get out of this. Okay. And then that helped tailor the questions a bit more towards like the business lens as well. So I'm going to ask you to even step it back a step further, make it even more simple. You keep talking about it. You said you just go into it and say, yes. I'm, here's the question here. What is it? for those who haven't worked with ChatGPT before? Yeah, so ChatGPT is a web-based generative AI system, okay. very simply spoken. It's a, 
it's like a chat bot and you can talk to it and ask it questions and it ultimately gives you, like it writes back and gives you output. And that's the, the generative part of that is all, it generates it for you. It's all fresh. It's not, you know, searching and returning answers or websites or pages for you. It's, cr it's creating the answer based on, and I don't want to get too technical, but all the training data that it has, you know, all the training data that's gone into it, everything it's learned, how it's been fine tuned. Yeah. Um, so based on all of, you know, what the creators built it on and trained it on and educated it on, it's creating an output. Essentially, it's predicting mm -hmm. what it's saying to you and creating it. So when you say it, again, you're referring to an application, Correct. a piece of software yep. that a user, you or I or any of our viewers, would actually type in a question or a series of questions. And it is learning from that experience how to answer what it is we're looking for. Correct. Okay. So you probably have all kinds of licensings and certifications, but for the mere mortal who doesn't have all those, mm -hmm. is there a cost to have done what you just did? How would they go about doing that? And is yeah, there a cost? so a lot of the platforms offer free, lower level, um, less robust uh, experiences, I would say, less capable okay. um, for free. So for example, pi.ai is one website people can go to and immediately chat with them without even creating an account. Immediately chat with like a, a generative AI chatbot without creating an account. Okay. ChatGPT does also offer a free version, but what you'll find and what I've heard is I've actually only, majority of my time is spent in the licensed version okay. of it. Um, but from what I've heard of people that use the free version and then they switch to the licensed version is that they notice a, a drastic jump in the quality of output that they get. So I personally, I believe it and I can understand why, right? You license it and you get more value or a more capable model. Okay. Um, so you can access all of this for free, absolutely. Um, but as far as like the licensed version, typically they're more capable. I'm just thinking of the, the brand new user who hasn't done this at all before, instead of going out and buying licensing, you're, you're saying there are ways they can kind of get an introductory model to it and sort of try before you buy. Absolutely. And see the results for it. Yep. So, I would ahead. also even add to that that there are a, there are multiple models to use, and it's it's really a race of who can make the most capable model with the best output. You know, can do the most things, um, but also not take a lot of you know compute on your a drag on your computer. So there's like a race out there with leaders. Mm -hmm. So even when you talk about trying before you buy, I would even encourage users to try, you know, try Pi.ai, try ChatGPT, try Gemini, which is Google's version of it. You know, there are different main models okay. that in the same way that use. there are different search engines. There's Google, there's Yahoo, there's Correct. Bing, that whatever the you know the multiple ones are, there are different flavors of a chat GPT and the other models exactly. are just listed. So you have options, I guess, is what we're trying to say to go yes. out and, and feel comfortable. Would you say they are counterintuitive? And are they difficult for the mere mortal to go in and work with or no? Okay. No, it's almost, I would say it's 100% the exact opposite. Um, you can get something out of it quite easily. I think what is, requires finesse is you know with anything as you learn it you'll get better at it mm -hmm. and the tricky thing is understanding that the better the output like you'll get a better output depending on all the information you give it and i always use like a, i use an example of if i were to log into chat and say i need ideas of things to do with my children this weekend it could come back with like winter ideas or summer ideas or swimming in a pool and i haven't given it any context no. To okay. what yeah. I could, you know, I could be like, it's actually the middle of December. What can I do? So the more details you give it, right. the more I'm going to get back that's useful for me. So it's really getting in that mindset of, we always say it's like delegating a task to someone. Like I wouldn't just come up to you and say like, I need a marketing plan. Mm -hmm. And then you'd come back with like, who, no, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Or maybe you'd come back with a marketing plan. Mm -hmm. like, this isn't what I was thinking, you know, and you don't really know. Like I need to delegate it appropriately, give you all the information you need, align our expectations, understand what the outcome is going to be so that when you come back with that output, it's what I was expecting. And so really taking that like mindset of delegation and trying to, you know, the right inputs, right. if you take that mindset and you interact with these, these bots, these generative AI systems, you're going to get an output that's closer to what you want and could use and is what you're expecting. 
So the more detail in the question, the more specific we can be, the better the answer would come back. Yes. It? Okay, I'm hearing that. So I've heard a little bit of concern uh, from, from teachers who say students have misused this type of product. And it sounds like what you're saying could lend itself because you can ask, write my paper on Shakespeare and absolutely tell me about the dangers of what's happened kind of in that space. Yeah, it's, it is tough. And I think that it is a perfect example of how this technology, how we're at a turning point in society where this technology is gonna make us rethink how we do things. Okay. Um, and specifically in the education space, I was reading a lot about the comparison of when the calculator was introduced. Mm -hmm. And obviously the big, different, big differences there among the obvious ones are it was slower, it was longer, we eventually integrated calculators into the, you know, into our education system and people thought, you know, who, no one's gonna learn how to do math and like that's not the case. People are still learning how to do math and we use right. our calculators and now we do more complex math. Um, the difference now obviously is that it's happening faster than anyone knows what to do with. You know, like this came out and students can use it and faculty and staff in the administration are, you know, like they still, everyone needs to figure out how to use it. Right. Um, so I think we're at a real turning point where we might just need to rethink how we do things and how can, we evaluate Can you put things. up guardrails around it or is it because it's just exploding so fast, it's outgrowing the guardrails before we even put them in place? So I think on the macro scale, it's yeah. a little bit of, it's like, it's it, they just keep going over each other. Yeah, so like we innovate and I'm talking like leaders and governments and like the EU is coming up with laws and the US is coming up with laws, like we innovate and then we, we think we catch up with regulation and then we innovate and then we need to catch up again you know so there's like this cat and mouse like back and forth and and I don't you know at some point it's got to settle down and we have mm -hmm. to have whatever but you know we're the race is real there as far as its role in education um, when it first came out I've heard I heard of a lot of school systems straight up banning it mm -hmm. and being like you absolutely can't use it it's plagiarism and that's certainly an approach um, but I always, I heard this quote one time that was like, don't fight innovation, it's a losing battle. Mm -hmm. And not that I'm saying, you know, I think there's an appropriate and a safe response to it for sure. Yeah. But I think understanding that it's a tool that we use and how can we use the tool? It's here, it's available. How can we use it appropriately to still under, like to still achieve our goals and demonstrate, you know, what we need our children of today to demonstrate and learn and understand. And it quite honestly could open more doors, you know? Well, we put pretty high expectations on our young people, on our businesses, on our government internationally, all the things that, so there's a lot of kind of expectations that we've created. So who's the boss? Who's technically in charge of creating these ground rules and say, no, that's a foul ball, you can't do that. <laughs> that's That a, doesn't exist right now. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that I don't even know if I have a really mm. great answer for that, other than obviously the large players are involved at the governmental level. Um, you gotta understand, I think you need to understand it yeah. before you can reg regulate it, right? Like what are the risks? What are we looking out for? I've heard of laws being put in place that if you're using a certain level of compute to train a model, you know, like if you breach thresholds that might indicate, you know, you're building a really capable generative AI model, then you need to file it or report it. So I think they're trying all different ways to get a better understanding well, of how to... I know at very high levels, the technology is being used to simulate war games, to simulate uh, innovations in vaccines. You know, instead of doing the manual 100 tests of this, they can do it in a microsecond because it's that much faster to program. Yeah. So we, we can't ignore the technology and we probably can't put guardrails around it. So what we have to do is understand it as best we can, which is what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. So. We're going to get technical for a second. I'm going to let you dive in deep. Then I'm going to pull you back out because I want to get practical and applicational for our sure. businesses. Tell me. So I thought the word was structure, but that doesn't seem to fit here. Help me understand what are the components maybe of this technology or what is, what's a good way for someone to learn about just so they have thing, hooks to hang this all on. Yeah, definitely. So similar to what when I first started about saying like the artificial intelligence landscape is vast. I think if you think about it as like like nesting like nesting dolls or you know it builds and it gets more capable and more complex so you have the world of artificial intelligence and over the years we started introducing you know predictive models and algorithms which really brought us to the machine 
learning level of things. And, you know, that goes back to like when you think of Google algorithms and search results and Netflix predictive engines and stuff like that. And then there is another layer deeper than that, which is deep learning, which I'm sure is a phrase people may or may not have, have heard of. But at that point, they changed the structure, you know, through this evolution, the structure of these like software applications is changing and they're coming up with more creative ways to process more stuff, more data faster um, and really evolving and making it more complex and more capable. And so now at the core, like where we are today, so another layer deeper from deep learning is generative AI. And that's where we're at today, where we have an immense amount of data. We have immensely large large language models that we're training these these generative AI systems. And we have an immense amount of compute and power behind us that we can run these things that take an immense amount of power and and really make them just like immense just crazy power behind it to train them and to turn them into like the crazy so, bots. And hopefully that that's to solve problems, not to create problems, right? I mean we're we're thinking this is a good tool and good technology. Right? Yeah, so. I think that's a you always want to think that, right? Yeah. And I I think the the reasonable thing that we should all keep our mind is, is as much as we think this needs to be used for good, there's obviously bad actors in this world and there's stuff that people will always find malicious ways to use technology. Mm-hmm. Um, and that exists here. That well, exists we're we're finding that they're, they're imitating voices of Joe Biden and everybody else yeah. and making commercials without the real person even being there, right? Absolutely. So, so that technology is out there. We're going to have to be aware of that as well. And that's a risk too, even from just a consumer standpoint. Forget like how to use it in your business and the risks there because there's an immense amount there. Yeah. But when you think of just the common person and how previously if I got an email that you know, had misspellings or typos in it. And I was like, I don't know, this looks shady. Like, I'm not going to click on that. Mm-hmm. Now they're enabled with, you know, perfect English written, you know, outputs from these systems right. that they can create and do, you know, better, stronger phishing attacks. So the bar like just got lower for them to do uh, illegal entry. Yeah, things. absolutely. So we're starting to talk about business a little bit. What what would you be concerned about as a business? What are the things that they should be aware of and looking out for? Like you just mentioned, the phishing schemes and things. What else? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of, there are obviously a lot of things to think about from the business standpoint. I think security and safe use is one mm-hmm. that we talked about. Um, as far as the potential or the improvement of the sophistication of attacks against your organization. So being hyper aware and extra vigilant, making sure your employees know the capabilities of what's out there and how to protect yourself against them. I think on the flip side of that, from inside out, you really need to be aware of how your organization is using these systems as well. Um, You know, you have contracts with your clients about NDAs and you need to keep private information private and um, there's been scenarios where people are just tossing data into these systems and you need to be conscious and aware of how you use it and how you use it safely. Because once you put it in, it's gone and it could go anywhere and be used against you later on. Yeah, somehow. they definitely. And or it could be used for training. A lot of systems use it for training data in the future. Data is gold to these companies. So um, they could use it for training data in the future. Some platforms, you read their terms and, and you know terms and conditions and stuff like that. Yeah. And they'll make clear statements that they don't use it for training data. And I, you know, as a business owner, that's a risk you need to decide if you're willing to take. Um, we obviously do it all the time with like Zoom calls or, you know, we, we put a lot of sensitive data in these software programs that we use. But one thing to always keep in mind is they're, you know, these are fairly new companies that are cropping up and emerging. Yeah. Um, so just being cognizant. Well, I think in your presentation, you had some statistic where we went from 14,000 to 50 some thousand within the last couple of years of companies that have developed right around this technology and trying to launch it for profit. There and- are so many companies. And I will say there's always the constant battle of, is it a product versus is it a feature? So all these companies crop up, they're new generative AI, they're built on you know, ChatGPT or Gemini, yeah. and they have a new business, but then all of a sudden, Microsoft, you know, maybe it's a PowerPoint creator, for example. Now Microsoft just introduces that into Microsoft PowerPoint and those businesses go away. Go away. Get, so <clears throat> what are some positive business experiences lately that you've heard of? Any that you could say were such and such a business, big or small, has used this technology and is a better person because of it? Yes. Yeah. Um, so two, one, I, I can actually point to act, like hardcore facts and outcomes. And one, <laughs> I can't wait to see the hardcore facts and outcomes. So the first one I'll reference is Moderna, 
Are you you're familiar with Moderna? The vaccine? Yes. Yeah, okay. So yeah. their company um, basically got into a partnership with ChatGPT and they have gone all in on their entire organization. Like you know, they want to launch 15 new products in the next five years. Okay. And they're encouraging everybody like AI, generative AI first. Within ChatGPT, you can make these custom GPTs like specific to actual like your own needs okay like you can train them specifically for for use cases and there was over 700 moderna's entire organization created over 700 of them within the first couple months of oh my goodness. of uh using yeah. these uh custom jet chat gpts so i don't have there's nothing like outcome yet outcome oriented but they know what their goal is launch the 15 products in the in the five years and they, their CEO had made a comment too that the work that they're producing or the research that they're doing and the stuff that they're trying mm -hmm. um, that ChatGPT is enabling them to do would have taken like a thousand people oh to be goodness. able to do that without it. So it's economies of scale really kicking in here. So Yeah, okay. and creativity and adding volume and some's going to work and some's not going to work. But the fact that they're doing it, I think is huge. Would you say that there's one trade or industry or segment of the market that's really more prone to take advantage of this? Or is it across the board, the world's the oyster right now? The world is the oyster. The oh. other example I have for you, which I love, um, is Klarna. They're a fintech company and they're more or less behind the scenes, they're like a, a payment processing company. And if you go ahead and look them up, there's all these stories out there about how they launched their customer service um, bot, for all intents and purposes, on top of ChatGPT, on top of OpenAI's platform. And they were able to launch it in 35 different languages. It's available 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And they saw real impact as far as so customers with challenges and problems come and talk to their customer service bot and they saw the resolution time drop from 11 minutes to two minutes oh my goodness they yeah, saw yeah. the drop in repeat inquiry mm -hmm. so if i'm coming back because my problem is not solved or i have an additional question they saw the drop in repeat inquiry by 25 percent and they didn't see an impact across the board in satisfaction so I'm sure you can appreciate, I mean, even just take your calculator out for that one. Like that's a real bottom line impact. That's a 500% return on that. Yeah. It's crazy. So um, is there, uh, is this like public domain? I don't know how else to describe it. I think of public domain, anyone can use it. There's no license required. The technology based on who you, who you buy it from, whether it's ChatGPT or the other ones you mentioned, you probably have a licensing fee with them. But you can use it however you want to use it, right? There's no public domain. I mean, there is public domain capability of this or? How, yeah, you know? so you, so there's also, so there's the companies we've talked about, which are let you license it and you use it however you use it. There's a current lawsuit going with New York Times and ChatGPT about like copyright and copyright infringement, which is getting into the world of who's responsible for the output. If I, as a user, create something that infringes on someone else's copyright, mm -hmm. you know, who, who's responsible for that? Is it ChatGPT because of what they trained it on and how the model understands things? Or is it me in the manner of which I used it? So that's, I'll take that, which is a loaded topic and, and shelve oh, it for a second, but yeah. just know that it's there. The other component of that is there's a whole open source world of large language models of these generative AI systems. And that's where Facebook, for example, Meta, the parent company of Facebook, that's where Meta plays. And there's a large French company too, um, Mistral, that is very strong open AI, I'm sorry, is a very strong open source platform. So okay. what open source means is they essentially make the model and all the code, the capabilities, what's inside it, available to developers. So there's a world where you know, you can just download it and customize it and use it yourself. And once it's out, it's like I've heard m multiple people reference it as letting the genie out of the bottle. So okay. at some point, I've definitely they've alluded to perhaps not as the models get more powerful, perhaps not making, making it open it. source. Well, that's kind of what I meant by but nothing slowing. Public domain. Yeah. So what, some of this technology, once it gets developed to a certain level, it is available for everybody. But if IBM wanted to have their own version of it, their own flavor of it, that can be proprietary and they can license it and copyright it or whatever they're going to do with it. Yeah, okay. definitely. OK, so let's get to the micro level. That was kind of macro. Yeah. So I'm a small business and I'm in the Farmington Valley and I really want to see if this can help me increase revenues or do lead generation or improve my marketing. How do I get started? What does that look like for someone like me? Yeah, definitely. So I think the short answer and like the cop out, but then I'll get 
into, okay. t into tangibles. Because <laughs> um, as what I was thinking through the answer to this question, um, if you literally, if you ask that question to a ChatGPT or a Pi or a Gemini, they will come back with all these ideas. And I think that that is a good place to start. So giving it context to what your business is, what you do, who your target profile is, and asking it, where can I find these? You can ask it, uh, come up with programs for me to run this summer, understanding that this is my target market or this is the service that I provide. Okay. I think a couple of the obvious er answers are in marketing, in mm -hmm. social media, um, being able to write posts um, to plan stuff out. I think tying your content that you're creating to perhaps when you think of putting posts out and maybe it's, you know, Mother's Day or National Pizza Day or, you know, making those connections between what's relevant in today's world and how that ties to your business. Like it can come up with concepts around uh, what you should write out, you know, put out there as content. Okay. Um, so hopefully it's like thinking for you. It, you give it the, the core question and it comes back with all kinds of options. And the it, again, is what we're referring to. That, that application will give you ideas, stimulate thinking of ways you can utilize this to, again, generate more traffic, get yes. more leads, maybe increase uh, revenue and hopefully reduce redundancies. I don't know. It can point out all kinds of things. Yeah, I tend to look at it as like two main areas. One, it makes something you need to do more efficient mm -hmm. by helping you do it. Um, and I say helping because I don't think you should ever take the output verbatim, take it and make it your own. And then I think the other thing it does is it adds value. So it's either making it more efficient of what you're doing and helping you get it done, or it's adding value that you didn't previously have before. And that's where like those creative concepts comes. It pushes the bounds. It comes up with new ideas. Um, oftentimes I'll use it as thought starters. You know, we reference it as like the white page buster. So if I don't even know where to start, mm -hmm. just ask it and it'll start it'll get the juices flowing and not necessarily that you take them, but that it kind of ignites you to come up with your own and stuff. And did you say that it sort of remembers and learns, it's heuristic kind of learning, it remembers what it's done before for you specifically? Yeah, so mm -hmm. definitely within uh, GPT, they just actually launched a feature called Memory. Okay. And you can see it. If you say something, it's like logging to memory and you can click on it and see the history of it. Um, but what they, up until now, and I would say it still applies to now too, if you have different chat channels, they say to keep the content, you know, similar content within each chat channel because it references all the previous oh, stuff that you've talked about. Um, also, these platforms, again, have different features like the memory. I've also seen ones where you can put in how you like to be talked to. Mm. So, oh. like, I appreciate, like, a straightforward, you know, direct, not a lot of fluff answer. And, like, I don't need a paragraph. Just tell it to me in a sentence. Yeah. So you can put those things in there and it'll adjust how it response to you. All right. So I'm a small consultant. I just moved into Simsbury or Granby. I'm setting up my office, but I'm trying to figure out who's my target audience. What demographic should I go after? So I can create a series of questions that I would type into chat GPT or Gemini, and it's going to come back and say, your, demogra your preferred demographic for this product set is this age group at this income level. I mean, it'll, it'll give you that specific an answer. Yeah. So I would even take it like one step back and say like, you know, you're in here, you set up, what is your demographic? I would even put that into ChatGPT and say, here's what I'm trying, here's my cert, what you're offering. Here's my offering. What do you think? Who my should I be sending? Yeah. Who should I be targeting? And if it doesn't give you what you want, you keep, keep going. Great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Can you give me more details? Tell me what type of income you think I should target. I, sh I should target. Um, let me know what the education level is of who my target audience is, you know, and keep pushing and keep asking questions. The beauty is they all, it always does it. <laughs> like I've had times where I'm like, I want you to rewrite this in 10 different ways. And, and they do it. And I'm like, nah, I'm going to need 10 more. <laughs> where it's like, I know if it was, if I was, you know, interacting with a real person, they'd be like, nope, you've, you know. You're on your own. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to keep doing it for you. <laughs> but So again, for our listeners, what I just heard was if you have any kind of idea of something you might want to launch and I, a product, a service, a consultancy, whatever it might be, uh, take advantage of just throwing a couple of ideas in front of one of these uh, chat GPT type things and see what it comes back with. It, it might help streamline a marketing plan. It might help you get started with some ideas and people to reach out to. Uh, may define the demographics of the age group uh, or the clientele specifically that you want to go to. 
Can this also do anything like create emails? If I said, yeah. okay, I wanna, I wanna reach out to all the Marys in the world who have some technology, but I wanna bring my product to them. How, how, what could it do for me in that sense? Yeah, so it's not going to like find them or get you the email addresses. You'll have to do that through- Or pay for a list. Yeah, pay for a list. But or the actual it, content that I wanna put in Absolutely, front of you. Absolutely, 100%. And you, again, it's how, um, how detailed you tell it what you wanna do. I'm, and if you tell it you're writing an email, I'm writing an email to this person to communicate this because I want them to do that. Give it that type of detail. Okay. If you just said, I'm trying to, you know, I need to write something about my service for this person. You could get a blog post. You mm -hmm. could get, you know, like how do you give it enough detail to get back as close to what you want as possible right. and then make it your own. Sounds like I don't have to go to work anymore. I can just go home <laughs> and launch bot questions or something. All right, so here's your opportunity. You've got the floor. You can go as deep or as low or as far as wide. What do you? What else do you want us to know about AI that we don't know that we should know? Oh man, I think the biggest part for me about the recent happenings in AI is okay. in generative AI is education and awareness. Like I think the most fruitful outcomes and the most amazing use cases and the most impressive you know behavior of these systems are limited by our own understanding and our own creativity okay. so learn all you can about it understand how it works and if you think that it can't do something try it like i can't even tell you how many times they're like oh i can't do that i'm like have you tried it like they are becoming multimodal which means they can communicate in different modalities. So I've seen scenarios where people take a picture. I did it, there. someone sent me an email about something and I took a picture of it and I sent it, I gave it to ChatGPT and I was like, how would you, how would you reply to this? Mm -hmm. So it's not, you can get the information in there a myriad of different ways, talking, you know, pic taking pictures, writing, and just push the bounds. And see what it comes back with. Always. Always. Well, it sounds like you're doing a lot of activity in this arena right now, and I understand you've got a few more activities coming up. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what else is coming up for Mary McVie. Yeah, definitely. So we have a Lunch and Learn that we're going to host at the Simsbury Library, and that'll be June 27th, right. and that'll be focused on business use, education, intro to AI and business use, um, which I'm excited about. And then I'm also doing a program with Granby Rec. Uh, this will be this summer sometime. It'll be a two-day kind of deep, intensive, immersive, uh, again, business-focused. And then my last thing that I'm going to launch in like the next month or so is going to be uh, monthly reoccurring like headlines, highlights, and happenings mm -hmm. sessions for uh, organizations. So what's happening in the industry? How do you keep your entire team up to date on you know the advancements the new products the new capabilities because again as as you can tell i think that's foundational to yeah. um, everyone's education and the possibilities that it can create within your organization okay so at the end of our time together i'm hoping that there'll be a slide that represents who you are and how folks can reach out to you or they can reach out to the chamber and we can connect with you regarding the lunch and learn we are going to be sending that information out and ask you to actually register through our website if you're able to attend that just so we can work with numbers it will be from 12 to about one or something like mm -hmm. that. And it will be taking this content and maybe drilling it down a little more specifically to the businesses that are there. And we'll try to get it so that it's very applicational for you. So I would say whether you're brand new and this is the first time you've heard these terms or whether you've been dabbling in it or whether you want to take it to the next level. I think Mary is all things AI. It can really go deep and wide if we need to. So I'd encourage you to join our Lunch and Learn. Go to the Granby Rec event as well or reach out and take an email if that's uh, if that's where you're at with all this. But closing comments, anything else you want yeah, to say? Yeah, no, I'm just excited. And thanks again for having me here. And I'm always interested in how people are using it or how people want to use it. So if anyone wants to brainstorm or get some hands-on demoing, I'm happy to, to wow. share and educate. That is a great offer, folks. <laughs> and I would say thank you for spending time with us. Thanks for kind of opening the door on this information and wetting our appetite just a little bit about what's going on now and where it's all going to keep on going. So yes. we look forward to talking more. I'll certainly see you at the Lunch and Learn and hope to see a lot of you with us as well at that event. So thank you for spending some time with us today. And thank you, Mary. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Bye now.
Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.